Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 144. Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. Albert Einstein. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Hollywood Camera Work. If you guys are interested in learning how to direct actors and become a actor's director, Hollywood Camera Work has developed an amazing master course called Directing Actors. And it is almost 30 hours, and I've taken this course, and it is by far the most comprehensive directing actors course I have ever seen. So if you want to get access to this course, head over to hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE to get 30% off. That's hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE. Today's show is also sponsored by Inside the Edit. If you guys want to learn about editing and the creative process of editing, there is no better resource than Inside the Edit. Now, the creator of it, Patty Bird, has been a multiple-time guest on Indie Film Hustle. He's well-respected by Avid, by the Editor's Union, by uh, every everybody. I mean, this what he's been able to put together is absolutely remarkable. So if you want to get more information about that, head over to InsideTheEdit.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE to get 25% off. That's InsideTheEdit.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE for 25% off. So guys, today on the show, we've got author Reed Martin, who is the author of an amazing book I read a while ago called The Real Truth, Everything You Didn't Know You Needed to Know About Making an Independent Film. What Reed did is he went around and interviewed over a hundred different independent filmmakers, very successful filmmakers, and just asked them, what were the mistakes you made? What are the pitfalls that you went through? And he wanted to kind of create a resource for filmmakers not to fall into those kind of debacles and lose money in the in the filmmaking process. So, of course, as you know, that's one of the reasons I even created Indie Film Hustle. So we are of two like minds without question. You know, in the book, he goes over uh, equipment problems, shooting day snafus, uh, post-production myths, theatrical distribution deal breakers, and amazing, a bunch of just other stuff that he go through and even gives you a top 50 mistakes every filmmaker makes. So I wanted to get him on the show. I wanted to kind of really dig in and uh, just milk as much information he's, as, he's, as he was willing to give us on this episode. So uh, without any further ado, enjoy my conversation with Reed Martin. I'd like to welcome to the show Reed Martin. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it, man. Um, so let's. I, wanted to, I always like to do the origin stories of my guests. So uh, how did you get into the business and how did you get interested in filmmaking? Well, you know, I've always been a, a film buff. I've been able to go to the Cannes Film Festival in 1995 as a guest of the French Embassy Trade Office. Mm-hmm. Um, I had entered a, an essay contest uh, that they had posted um, up at Columbia and I actually won that. I wrote about French cinema and its challenges of, of, uh, finding an audience, a modern audience in the United States. Nice. So, um, then after grad school, I worked at 20th century Fox film in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, so I worked in marketing there. Then I was director of marketing at producer Carrie Woods, New York based production company, independent pictures. Mm-hmm. And then, um, I covered Sundance for USA today That was in 2005 and taught a course at NYU for six years from about 2003 to 2009. And during that time, I had the inspiration and wrote uh, my first book, which is The Real Truth, Everything Mm -hmm. You Didn't Know You Need to Know About Making an Independent Film. And um, ever since then, I've been uh, sort of uh, out on the road, just sort of helping people realize their dreams of making their first or second film. Now, what um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience making uh, making films? Have you made have you made a, a film yet? Or you, I'm sure I, you have. I have actually. Yeah. Well, I made a short. Okay. And the thing was, it was a very expensive short. Yeah. <laughs> those always aren't those the best type. Exactly. Well, <laughs> the, they may not be. I yeah, mean, tell me about the it. The thing is, it almost you know you could almost make a feature for for how much I made the short for door to door. It was like forty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, which is which is quite a lot. And, yes. Um, the problem is. Because I wasn't necessarily from 
the independent production side. I mm -hmm. knew a lot of people in the independent film world, but I didn't have a crew of people who were coming up with me. I didn't hadn't gone to film school, so I didn't really have a lot of people I could call on. And as a result, uh, most of the people I hired to work on it were very extremely talented, but they all came from advertising and creating ads. And so they typically wanted their day rate. And so all mm -hmm. of a sudden, if you're in a most favored nations situation, then you're paying sort of full freight for everybody. And that, oh. that can be, that's, that's, that's one challenge. Mm -hmm. The other one is that we shot on this very high end, high definition format, which can have its own problems because Workflow. once you, shoot, once you decide to shoot, um, on a very high end, then everything has to be done sort of that way. And so mm -hmm. that, as, as we can discuss today in the podcast, um, that can have implications for post. It can have implications for your production. And so it kind of um, boxes you in to doing things, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the hard way or the expensive way. And so that was another issue. But, but really, um, you know, the, having this experience of making this film, uh, which had a very large cast as well, um, you know, I went about doing it the, totally the wrong way, as many people do on <laughs> In fact, that's one of the that's one of the exciting, fun parts about my book, The Real Truth, is that I interviewed all these famous filmmakers, 100 famous filmmakers that, you know, and admire and, and want to emulate. And I asked them, you know, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you on a film set? And very often, many of them, many of their first films that we think of as their first films are actually not their first films because their first films never saw the light of day and they had to keep going and mm -hmm. make another film that became their first film. So it's one of the reasons having gone through this experience myself, which was you know, really akin to uh, Steve Buscemi in Living in Oblivion. Almost. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a um, great movie that is! You know, isn't it great? It really encapsulates the the whole the whole experience. The grip, the the grip, the grip with the screenplay in the back pocket is just brilliant. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> Not only the back pocket, but the way that it's folded over. Yes, it's yes, yeah. it's all wrapped like up. That. Yeah, because it's in it's his back folded. pocket. I know exactly. It's perfect. I know it's just great. <laughs> um, every character was so indelible in that in that film. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons I wanted to write The Real Truth, because I had asked the producer, Ted Hope, uh, who now works at Amazon, I had asked him way back when at the, uh, I think it was at the IFFM, which I guess then mm -hmm. became IFP. Mm -hmm. um, I said, you know, what are all the things that can go wrong on a film set? And he said, oh, you know, it would take hours to explain and it would fill the pages of the Manhattan phone directory. Mm -hmm. um, and so after I made this this HD short that I made, I decided I would write a book that was actually as big as the Manhattan phone directory, or at least approaching it. It's 540 pages. It's, yeah, of, it's a pretty of, thick book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because there's just so many things. And so, um, you know, about everything that would go wrong on a film set, but I didn't want people to take it from me because I wasn't someone who anybody had heard of. So I, I asked all the famous filmmakers I could, uh, independent filmmakers I could speak to at leading film, film festivals in New York and Park City during Sundance, and I asked them to tell me their stories. And if if something that I had gone through on my short extrapolated had, had ever happened to them, and in fact, the things that I included in the book were the things that happened to me and also happened to them. And, and to answer your question, you know, about the experience of making your first film, I mean, we had all kinds of problems that no one had ever mentioned, like time code bubbles and bad sound and <laughs> bad line readings, and we needed a ton of ADR. We had missing mm -hmm. shots that we mm -hmm. didn't shoot because we didn't storyboard. Um, there were some issues with the HD video, which we can discuss. We had a backup uh, hard drive that failed. It just went on and on. And <laughs> one of the things that was the most surprising to me, which is something that I just never heard of, and there's a ton of these, which is that we had some kind of weird phantom reverb on some of the actors' voices oh. because we were, we were shooting in a giant, in a, in a very large room. And so when you're shooting in a, in a, in a space that's that large, the actors' voices can come in with a bit of an echo on it, even if you have the boom right up to their sure. right up to their faces. And so, what so what I one of the things I talk about in the book is how if you're going to do a location scout, you find the perfect place, you have to actually or you should bring your sound engineer mm -hmm. along with you yep. to the scout so that you can find out if there's some kind of issue, whether it's you know uh, whether it's planes flying over every five minutes or whatever it is. But there can also be very subtle issues with sound that make a location unusable. Oh yeah, With, without quite. I mean, I had an anomaly happen with me once on a shot of film uh, on on actual thirty five millimeter, and there was something wrong with the gate, and I got phasing in the film. Oh, wow, wow! I literally got phasing, so there was like streaks of light coming. All, anytime there was a light, there was a streak that would go oh, wow. straight up, and it was just it was just the gate. There was something wrong with the gate, and light was le leaking in, and basically all that footage was. We kind of fixed it. But it was pretty much useless. So these are things that people don't talk about. 
That's and why this I love is that. Not some kind of a Kubrick effect that you were going for. No, I wish I yeah. wish I could say yes, it was, but no, it was not a Kubrick effect. Though now thinking about it, yes, yes, it was. No, uh, but or like Terrence Malick or something with all kinds of or or my, who has all the lens flares? Like, well, that would be that would be yeah, no, but that but lens flares don't go up; they go side uh, to side. Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> it went yeah, up. But. It was very unpleasant, but yeah, things are like that. Like you, know, like you were saying with the sound, like uh, you know, like oh, this is a great location. On but if sound sucks, then you gotta. The, the thing is, and I find with with production in general, and and I know you talk a lot about this in the book, is that you got to think about the long game. You got to think about the workflow. You got to think about the path because this one decision can just the it could um the waves of that one decision can just affect so many things, and you have to have that mentality of thinking about things. Uh, down the line, as opposed to just right what's in front of you. Does that make sense? Do you agree? I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book is that you need a fundraising effort to fund the fundraising effort. You have to make. You have to raise some money so that you can have this interval to go around and talk to people. Because otherwise, you know, you may you may not be able to sustain your effort of raising the funds. And to your point, you know, with workflow, you have to make if you're shooting on some kind of exotic new camera or some sort of high end equipment. Uh, yeah. Um, you need to you need to test your workflow all the way to the end. You almost need to make a short film, a one minute short, or a two minute, ad, a thirty second advertisement, or a YouTube video, whatever it is. You need to test your workflow all the way through post, all the way to the end, to make sure that you're not going to have some strange anomaly, as as you pointed out, or some kind of thing that you just never would have thought of. Right at the end, when you get into post production, where all the magic is supposed to happen, you can end up in a in a complete uh, catastrophe. Oh, and 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 I've and I've seen many of those in my day. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, it really is just the most collaborative of the arts. And the thing that people don't realize is that, you know, I'm not saying this to be discouraging. I'm saying this is what the real truth focuses on to help you, you know, realize your dreams. And 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 it's okay to have your head in the clouds as long as your feet are on the ground. But people people just don't uh, realize that sheer force of will, sheer force of will, if you have the stamina and the drive of like a James Cameron or a Catherine Bigelow, that's not enough to carry the day because there are so many technical issues and there are so many people who have to be operating at the top of their game. And very often it's just difficult to, to, to corral all of that um, and also to, to foresee everything that you might run into. And it's, it's honestly a miracle when a movie's made. It's it's truly I mean for anybody who's been in the trenches, to get a full blown movie made with everything hitting at on all, on all cylinders, is an absolute miracle. It really is, especially in the indie world. It's almost, I mean, it's just fascinating when I see a good indie film that everything worked, the story worked, the cast worked, the lighting worked, the camera worked, the directing worked. Uh, it's such a rare thing. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, it really can be. That's the thing. People would be much more forgiving. Of, of movies that they see, you know, they wouldn't shrug their shoulders and say, eh, or something like that. If right. they knew all of the, oh. the, 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 you know, the effort and, and, and deprivation that was poured into, you know, poured into it. Cause it's, it's very hard to even, it's as challenging as you just said, to even make a not so great independent film, let alone a, a stellar film. Just a technically sound film. Yes. <laughs> just Absolutely. just Absolutely. making a technically sound film screw the acting screw the writing screw the directing just something that technically works yeah. that's a miracle in today's world you know it's 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 really fascinating and because i've been in post for over 20 years doing indie films i under, i mean i from experience can tell you uh it is a miracle sometimes but but filmmakers do definitely have to think about uh about the whole process and let me ask you look what what are some of the troubles that filmmakers get into in post well, that's the thing, you know, to your point, um, you know, a lot of people say, don't worry, we'll, f- we'll fix it in post. You know, oh, oh, I hate worry that. About it in post. I mean, that's a, <laughs> sort of a catchphrase that, that people hear and it's reassuring. But some what what people may not know. And one of the things I discuss in The Real Truth is that some things go wrong that they can't be fixed in post. Mm-hmm. Uh, some things go wrong during production, but also things can happen in post that that can go off the rails in post and they may not be fixable. Um, not everything is fixable in post. And so an obvious one that people overlook again is that if they're shooting with very high definition cameras or they get some kind of a deal on a free camera or a mm. loaner camera or a test drive or something like that, say they're shooting in 6k or even we'll push ahead for, you know, next year or something like that. Say they have a chance to shoot at 8k if that becomes uh, a it's, thing that, that's that, lunacy, that's lunacy widely available. <laughs> so all of a sudden, so you have this amazing camera and you're shooting in this ultra high definition format but all of a sudden it causes big problems in post because the file sizes of the video are gigantic. 
So that means you need an editing an editing bay. You may not be able to edit on a MacBook Pro. You may need some much higher end machine like a Dell Precision or you know a Mac Pro Tower. So that's much more expensive. And you know the the file size is so large that the store you have storage issues now with your hard drives and your backup hard drives and your scratch hard drives. So if you were shooting in 2K or 4K, now you've got you know double the amount of equipment and backups that you need on the on the post side. Um, there's also, you know, there's problems with sync sound. I think you mentioned mm -hmm. that you had an issue with 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 that at one point. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're shooting on some, if your sound equipment is not completely matched up to the uh, the camera you're using, then you can have an issue in post where you have to resync the sound and it can go out of sync, and so you get dialogue bleed, and that can be a whole headache. And so you can basically spend your entire post interval, which people typically under budget for they don't think of they, oh. don't, they don't give themselves a cushion they may give themselves a cushion on the shooting or they may give themselves a cushion mm -hmm. on, on the budget for a crane day or for some special oh event. of course of course but, but they don't budget yeah well, go, ahead, go ahead no the po but in post they never you always you always run out of money in post always right <laughs> and that's typically why so many people need finishing funds it's not because they need to film a shot that they weren't able to get. It's because they ate into their post or they ate into their, uh, you know, their remaining budget for other things, for licensing or, or for music to, to just get the film shot. But everybody ends up needing finishing funds on some level or another interval of fundraising, another Kickstarter round at the end to be able to finance the post, the post part. I guess another recent problem that people are having in post is that, um, you know, they may choose to shoot, they may choose, excuse me, they may choose to edit on, you know, Final Cut, Pro X or FCP 10, Final Cut yeah. Pro 10, whatever they're yeah. calling it. And not a lot of professional editors are using that anymore. A lot of folks who were using Final Cut Pro 7 have now switched to Premiere or Avid or whatever they came up with themselves. But all of these things, especially in post, people sort of push it to the back burner. But it's something that the line producer should be discussing early. It's something that the director should be and the producer should be discussing early. Absolutely. And, and a post supervisor would be lovely to consult at that at some point along the way. Not even at some point along the way. You should get a post supervisor. The post supervisor should be on day one. Yes. The post supervisor should be brought in. Some people are thinking like, well, I don't want to have to pay this person's day rate for them to sit around and do nothing. But that you're not that's that's not how it is. You should bring in the post supervisor way early so that they can get out ahead of the things that are gonna cost you double and triple down the line. That's the other funny thing about post is that a lot of people who think like, well, every time you try to say you try to do, you know cut corners or save money or save a nickel, you end up paying you know ten times as much as it would have cost to to do it the right way mm -hmm. uh, when when the time comes around. And so, absolutely having your your post supervisor on early as part of the just as part of the main the main team is is really crucial. I always I always tell them if they can't afford a post supervisor, at least consult one. Pay them a few hours, pay them a day to come in and set up the workflow for you and then also be available for questions along the way at minimum. At minimum because if not, like you say, it will cost them down the line. I mean, it's just it, it just will <laughs> without question. Right, right, absolutely. Now, if you were going to market or distribute an indie film in today's world, what would you do? Well, you know, the thing is about marketing independent films today, I mean, there's so many more opportunities than there used to be. I mean, people used to just sort of take their their cans of, of, of film mm -hmm. around with them, you know, from place to place or have screenings based on the topic of interest, um, you know, where you might have screenings on army bases or or whatever or whatever it was. But, um, you know, today there's just an enormous number of platforms that you can get the word out. I mean, you can join up every film group on Facebook and there are literally, you know, 90, I'm not kidding. Like no, there's a, hundreds, hundreds, there's hundreds. hundreds. You yeah. can join all of those and you can, you can get the word out that way. There's, you know, obviously there's Twitter and stuff like that. And while that might be an echo chamber or a vacuum of just the person's friends, um, you know, there, there are other ways to sort of create a splash. I mean, you can put something on Vimeo, you can put, uh, trailers on Facebook. You can possibly take snippets of your film and use them as kind of bumpers to help promote a certain topic. If there's a, if there's an issue that your, your film addresses, um, so you can, you can sort of use little trailers of your movie to, you know, to, to help promote an issue, issue oriented or something like that. Um, you know, there's a, there, the thing I would advise people, and one of the things I talk about in The Real Truth is that, um, you know, hiring a, a publicist and, you know, paying them $5,000 or $10,000, that may or may not 
get you an article in a, in a, in a publication that would attract interest. Um, that's not necessarily the, the best way to go. And you might use that $5,000 to buy targeted advertising. Mm-hmm. Again, on Facebook, that's something where you can get really micro-targeted. Um, just the other thing is just to try to, you know, try to get to festivals, try to, um, you know, try to interest you know, publications, online publications, you know, or, or, you know, publications that you might not think of, which are covering a certain issue. If there's a certain issue that, that becomes top of mind in the, in the, in the national news, you might say, well, I have a film that actually discusses that issue. And you can reach out to managing editors who you can find in the, in the staff box of, of any magazine that you, that you look at and look for the managing editor and you can pitch to them and say, Hey, you know, this is a topic of interest. It's getting a lot of press. I happen to have made a film. We're available for interviews and we can send you a copy of it and you can get some traction there. Getting a mention in a major national magazine as the film that covers XYZ topic could be a springboard into generating more national interest. And and also, uh, do, would you agree that in today's indie world, the filmmakers should not focus on trying to hit a mass market and focus Focus more on a niche. Um, you know, I think that I think the niche audience is just where things are going. I think it's very hard to be to make an independent four quadrant, you know, movie mm-hmm. that's going to just attract everybody. I think even if you are, it's it really goes the other way. It's almost like Hollywood is making movies that are uh, designed to to appeal to the widest audience, but are being being viewed by niche audiences just because people have their you know they have their interests, they have their binge watching shows and they have their, you know, their news feeds and things like that. And I think it, in many ways, while there's this cornucopia of content out there, people's uh, blinders are on so that they really only focus on a certain number of topics of interest. So yes, I mean, if, if you're courting the, if you're courting the exact perfect audience for your movie, then that may be the most efficient approach. Definitely. Now, and how about distribution? What do you, what's your feeling on distribution in today's world? You know, there's a myth. There's a myth that you can get, uh, you can four wall. You know, you, that you can rent out a house. You you might be able to rent out a house in your local theater in your hometown for a premiere mm-hmm. for one night. But there's sort of an ongoing myth that you can, you know, take your film that you could show on a on a 2K projector in a, in a in the local AMC and say, okay, well, you know, can I rent one of the houses in your multiplex and show your, you know, my film? And and that that is kind of a myth of yesteryear. The problem is. There are so many name brand independent films out there that uh, have, you know, that are in the pipeline for distribution that it's very hard for uh, a theater or an exhibitor to take one of those films off and sort of kick them off and put up your independent film, even if even if you have the money to pay for the for the house to Mm -hmm. to rent. So Mm -hmm. so that's that's something that is, um, you know, that people should have a reality check on at the same time, though, you know, not every. A uh, movie needs to be shown during the day. Obviously, if there's, fa- there, you know, there's family fair that's showing that's on, on a weekday. That's not necessarily something that is going to need to be up on the screens for the for the twelve o'clock, two o'clock, four o'clock show on a weekday. So that it is possible to, uh, and also because of digital exhibition now, it is possible to make fast changes and to, and to possibly get a an exhibition birth that way. But as far as, you know, distribution goes there, you know, there's, there are companies like distributor, distributor, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, there are, you know, there are companies that, you know, you can no not a lot of people, you know, buy DVDs anymore in the traditional sales that they sales Avenue that they used to, but you could sell DVDs, um, from a merch table. So if you have, if you have a free screening or a presentation of your documentary or of, of your film and you have people come to it, you might have people. You might have twenty or thirty or a hundred people who leave the theater and they want to buy a copy of the film as a DVD, as a gift, mm-hmm. or as a keepsake, or as a souvenir. And so, even even generating screenings like that might be an avenue to possibly selling copies of, of the movie and, and generating revenue that way. Just always thinking outside the box, basically. And the game, the rules are changing so rapidly, almost daily now, <laughs> that you have to kind of roll with the punches and just start thinking untradi- intra- untraditionally. Well, that's true. I mean, there are companies out there that can help you get your film uh, converted to the right formats and digitized and, and put up on, you know, on iTunes and these other places mm-hmm. for money. So again, like distributor. Is Distributors are a really great company. It really yeah, really and company. so that's that's one of the avenues that people can look into to getting set up on on 
you know, online and, and having and monetizing their films that way. But then again, there are all sorts of issues. Like if you if you had a you know, if you if you were making a low budget version of, of like Blackfish uh, about mm -hmm. the, the, you know, Tilikum, the orca mm -hmm. whale, you know, if you had something like that, a version of that, maybe it was about dolphins or whatever, dolphin training or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you had a lower budget version of that, you might reach out to the ASPCA or to PETA or something like that. And you could possibly you know, partner with them, give them some clips. Um, there, there might be a way to, to sort of cross promote or cross market your project with somebody with, a, with an organization that's already established that has a huge mailing list that has a way to reach people who are very passionate and interested about your topic as well. And so that's a way to plug in and to, and to reach a, an audience that you could possibly monetize again with a keepsake DVD, not, not selling the DVD as you used to, like, you know, in a, in a big box store or something or in a bookstore, but just that people would buy it as a keepsake or a gift to, to people who are similarly passionate about your topic. Very cool. Now, what, what would you suggest for filmmakers looking for financing today? Because everyone's always looking for money for their next projects. What do you have any suggestions for? Well, you know, for filmmakers looking for financing, that's that's really where everything starts. That's probably the most important question there is. And I have a uh, I have two chapters on on, on financing actually uh, in the real truth. And one of the things I wrote about in the book is that filmmakers often think that they think erroneously that there's only one person who can finance their film. It's like this one relative or the one friend, and that person is going to be their miracle, and they're going to either you know finance the movie out of their ATM card right then and there, or yeah that that person is going to be a conduit to the quote unquote right people that they have, that this person has a circle of, you know, of friends or high net worth individuals who that person is going to be the bridge. And this isn't always the case. And I think people get discouraged because if it doesn't go well, if that person that they were counting on as the bridge to their financing doesn't really, uh, doesn't really groove on being th thought of as, as, you know, as a pocket uh, book like that, um, then they get discouraged and they think, okay, well, my film, it's not possible. We're, the, you know, my, my one miracle is not going to be possible. And that's actually not the case. There's a lot of different inflection points where fil aspiring filmmakers can get financing and they just shouldn't put their eggs in one basket. They should expand the timeline that they think it's going to take to raise the money because it often takes a lot longer than people think. But they should also think about other routes. I mean, yes, today there's Kickstarter, there's Indiegogo, there's even Patreon. You know, there are ways for people to generate money from from big uh, audiences. But also, as I talk in, about in my book, there, you know, you might go to the Sundance Screen Screenwriters Lab. You might get the script accepted into some other program where it gets producers interested and then they can help with the financing or they can help attract a star who will, you know, attract overseas, uh, you know, financing or some other some other money from other sources. And so a lot of movies that start out as screenplays in the Sundance program or short films, they get made, you know, they get into a major festival and they, um, a producer sees it at, at the festival and asks if there's enough material to expand the short into a feature film. Uh, famously, Napoleon Dynamite started out as a short that was in a festival and then producers said, you know, hey, let's, let's, let's expand this. And then Whiplash also mm -hmm. uh, famously started out as a short film. I think it was that big scene in the music room that everybody remembers uh, with J.K. Simmons uh, freaking out. So, I mean, that was just a short film, just that bit. And so, you know, having that, having a calling card or having a short that you can take around with people and say, you know, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Uh, here's here's essentially the vibe that we're going for. That can help with the finance saver. And one of the things I think people don't think about either, which is which is another one, is finding somebody who can storyboard, finding an aspiring artist who's out there who can storyboard the entire screenplay for a couple of hundred bucks or even a couple of thousand bucks. It's, it's worth paying for so that you end up with this kind of um, – with this graphic novel. So you have the graphic novel and you go around to people and it basically is represented all the shots that you're going to have in the film and basically telling the story with the, you know, with all the stencil and all that. And you basically can help people see your vision and see what this film is going to be realized. That's a lot more compelling than saying, than going to somebody and saying, Hey, I'm an independent filmmaker. I have this script. Will you read it? And, you know, I'm looking for money and having, having your hand out. It's much more compelling to have a finished thing, like a finished short that you can show people and you can say, this is what we're going for. This is the vibe. This is the energy. We're going to expand it out. It's a much, don't you want to see what happens next? Or if you have this, you know, very high end, very glossy, very professional, I'm not talking about using mm -hmm. storyboard quick necessarily or doing it with stick figures. I'm talking about real full on polished, you know, polished comic graphic novel quality. And then that's something that you can go around to people and you can show that. And 
I think that's a lot more compelling than, and it's, a, it's certainly a, a much better approach than hoping that the, you know, the one friend that you have who has access to capital is going to bust you a check for $300,000. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now you were talking about uh, t- attaching talent. What, how should independent filmmakers approach talent when they're uh, trying to attach them to, to their project? This is another thing that I, that actually I talked through, I talk about all through the real truth uh, because it's a tricky thing att- attracting talent. I mean, you know, for the real truth, I actually interviewed both Dylan Kidd, the director, writer, director, and Campbell Scott, who's a writer, director in his own right, who starred in Dylan's film Roger Dodger, which was actually one of Jesse Eisenberg's first uh, starring roles. Um, and so, you know, D- Dylan Kidd at the time, who was an aspiring writer, director, was working all kinds of odd jobs around Manhattan. I think he was a home care attendant and he was like a bouncer in a pool hall and he was trying to drum up interest for his script. And he what it happens, he runs into Dylan Kidd on the street. I'm sorry. He runs Dylan Kidd runs into Campbell Scott on the street. He palms his screenplay on Campbell Scott, gets him to appear in the film. And Campbell Scott allows Dylan Kidd to write and direct it now. That's a great story, and everybody is so inspired when they hear that at you know on <laughs> panel discussions at festivals. However, the problem is everyone leaves hearing that story thinking that that's how it happens, or that that's how <laughs> it's going to happen with them, or that they're going to run into somebody on the street and they're going to palm the script on them. And the, that's just not how it works. The problem is, you know, somebody who's shopping for groceries at you know Gristidi's or in L.A. at Bonds or something like that. They, they don't want to hear how someone, how some aspiring filmmaker is going to resurrect their career, like Tarantino or something. Right. Them, you know, like, like, hey, you know, you're kind of washed up, aren't you? Like, I, I can totally get you back on time. Like, they just wow. don't want to hear that. Sure and they, also, they also don't want to have to carry around a screenplay with their groceries, you know, in the checkout line or have like five or six screenplays under their arm. So they, that, it, it's just a myth that, that people are delighted to hear, you know, how passionate a fan you are and that you've got the screenplay and you happen to have it in your backpack on you or you have it in your car. Can I run out and get it? And the problem is, um, you know, there's only one Dylan kid. He's the exception. It's just not how movies are made. People just don't want to hear that. People actually get mad at me. They're Mm -hmm. like, no, that is how it happens. And they really push back on that because it kind of upsets their apple cart. It, It kind of breaks with their, you know, how their dream is organized. And that's the thing. I didn't write the real truth coming from me personally. I interviewed filmmakers that you would know, Alexander Payne, Darren Aronofsky, Werner Herzog, uh, Christopher Nolan, uh, you know, Ken Burns, Barbara Koppel, all these people who tell you, who basically confirm what I'm saying, and then they tell you their stories. And that's why the book is, is telling you, is telling you the truth. This is how it goes. So to get talent to appear in your film, um, you, you just have to go through regular channels. You have to go through the actor's agents or you have to attend a festival or better yet get into a festival with a short or with your screenplay and then try to court actors that way. Or you have to you know have money in escrow that you can make a formal offer. If you go to an actor's agent and you say, we have you know $100,000 in escrow, here's the bank statement, or we have $500,000 or however much it is, and we'd like your actor to appear on these days, that, is, that, is an, that as an avenue will get your script read. But an even better, smarter approach, I think, to approaching talent is not looking for somebody who's been in a million independent films or not looking for somebody who the actor has their heart set on or who they, you know, first, you know, got got excited about movies watching. You know, Jennifer Lawrence, when she was just starting out, when Deborah Granick was casting and directing Winter's Bone, Mm -hmm. she cast Jennifer Lawrence, who had only been in one or two other small films before that. Mm -hmm. And she was not the star. Jennifer Lawrence was not the star. I mean, of course, now she's one of the biggest, you know, actors there is ever and probably has a a 20 or a 25 million dollar rate. But the thing is, the best way to approach talent is to approach the best talent that an individual filmmaker can have and create the next star or the next Jennifer Lawrence or something like that and cast the best actors that you can in your project and not necessarily think, not necessarily be wedded or tied to someone who is an established star or somebody who has been in other independent films that are similar to yours. Very, very, very good advice. Now, you also talk a lot about um, distribution deal breakers. What are some of those? Because there is a long history of distribution companies that are not on the up and up sometimes. (laughs) Well, I mean, there's that, but more often than not, it's it, it goes the other way. I mean, the f- aspiring first-time independent filmmakers—they've made so many sacrifices, and you know, they've ate eaten Rice Krispies and and water 
practically, or right. you know, whenever the uh, the classic independent filmmaker line when they get asked would they like a drink, a beverage with whatever their lunch order, no, you know, they're going to save two dollars mm-hmm. on their lunch order. But um, you know, there's so much sacrifice that goes into making an independent film, and the real truth really covers a lot of that. But when it comes to distribution deal breakers, that's the shocking thing is that they can get all the way to having a finished film, and they can be talking to distributors at a major festival, and then the whole thing falls apart. And one of the the biggest ones that I discuss in the book is really music rights because people will assume wrongly that they can load up their independent films with all of this moving, compelling music and, you know, it really makes the movie powerful and, and, oh my gosh, it's just, it really cuts together well. It just cuts perfectly. And then they get to the distribution conversation and none of the music has been cleared. They may or may not even have festival rights to the music. And so essentially independent films every year at festivals become this mini subprime mortgage crisis. <laughs> I mean, that really is how yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. the, they, could, they could very well look to independent film as a, as a precursor to that because what happens is you've got an independent film that, that the filmmaker wants to sell for 500000 or for a million or for you know, $10 million or however much they, they, they're dreaming of selling it, but the film has a – the film might have a $700,000 or $1 million or $1.5 million uncleared music budget, and it is wrong to assume – that a distributor will just step in and make that go away yeah, or, yeah. or pony up the money from it. Typically what happens is it, even if you do get the film sold, the clearances and all that other stuff comes out of your advance or out of your entire payment. So all of the money that would have gone to the investors, all the money that would have gone to the filmmakers who are working on deferred budgets or who are hoping for points or upside, it all goes to clearing the music and everybody ends up with nothing. Or the distributor just says, look, that's there's no way. It's too much forget it. And they just walk away. A lot of times distributors just, there, there are other films who have done it the right way. There's so many films who have done things the way that they're supposed to do that they don't have to hassle and they don't have to haggle with somebody who hasn't, who has all sorts of unpaid liabilities in their project. I mean, other distribution deal breakers are that they don't have the chain of title. They don't, to, to the film, the, they don't have uh, clearances for all of their actors and for all of their extras. That can be a problem. Um, there can be issues, there can be legal issues in terms of if, if the documentary subject is portrayed in a, in a poor light or something, that person may or may not sign off. So there are all sorts of of issues that you can get into. And, you know, these are things that you have to, you have to really talk about and discuss with your team up front. I don't want to give too many of them away because I want people to, to take a look at the real truth. But, um, you know, those are just some that, that, uh, that, folks should think about ahead of time. Now, let me ask you a, a, a question, though. Do you think in today's world, depending on the budget of the film, does it even make sense to go with a full, like a full-blown distribution company as opposed to self-distribution? Because if you make a movie for 50 grand, 100 grand, you know, could you, if you're smart and built an audience and so on and so forth, distribute the movie yourself and be able to recoup your money, but definitely something under 50 grand in today's world uh, or or go with a distributor because, you know, on, a, on that kind of budget, you know, I've, I've seen so many times that they'll never see a dime ever, 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 ever. And even if you get a, these big deals that get signed at Sundance, that are like, oh, you know, they, they sold that movie for a million bucks. I'm like, that's great, but they will never see another dime again. That's all they're ever going to see. So, and which is not bad. Trust me, I wouldn't mind a million dollar payday either. But, but in today's world, do you think, you know, is it even worth going with a big distributor on a low budget indie, like anywhere from 50 grand below? I mean, that's a great question that you bring up because the, the issue is it may not even be because of financial shenanigans. It, 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 people are assuming mm-hmm. when they hear a question like that that they're getting ripped off or they're getting hosed in some way, but that's just not how it works. I mean, mm-hmm. distributors are taking a huge, huge risk and they're ponying mm-hmm. up the money for the, for the, for the film itself mm-hmm. and actually pro, you know, for guarantees for, for putting it out and distributing it. But the marketing, you know, the marketing can be can certainly even on a, a larger budget film can cost more than, than the film. If, if a distributor is going to spend, you know, eight or nine or $10 million on marketing, they're only getting back half of that from the theater. So they may buy a film for a million dollars for, for, an, uh, you know, for a minimum guarantee. And then, which, which is also very high these days. A lot of times there's no there, minimum guarantees are also kind of a thing of the past. That's another, uh, unless you're, unless you're Netflix or Amazon or Hulu. <laughs> for, well, I mean, <laughs> different yeah, business sure. model, different business model. 
different business model, but but the classic minimum guarantee where mm-hmm. the filmmaker and the producer and the financiers assume they're going to be made whole at a, at a festival mm-hmm. by getting a big publisher's clearinghouse check, that is not necessarily how things go these days. More often than not, they'll get a promise for distribution and a certain level of marketing and guarantees for that, but they won't get, and then they'll have to sort of recoup the cost of the of the production from that. It's not like here's here's the money that it cost you to make the film, and then now we're going to release it. That's that's something that is uh, very much in the rearview mirror going these days. Not not in every case. Yes, you get the big headline grabbing, you know, the big headline grabbing sales, but but more and more often than not, minimum guarantees are, are are very rare. And so the challenge can be that a distributor is putting up say ten million for marketing or five million for marketing. They're only getting half of that back from the exhibitor. And so the reason that the filmmaker never sees any money is because either the film was too aggressively released or the marketing was too aggressive Mm -hmm. or the approach, the release approach was such that the the distributor themselves may not recoup initially until it reaches ancillary like, you know, home video or iTunes or these other these other platforms. So it's not always the case that going with a distributor is you know a way that you're you're not going to see a dime because uh, because you're you're being treated unfairly. It's just because of the economics of independent film are so challenging these days. Yes, to your question, self distribution is a way that people absolutely at the five hundred. I'm sorry, at the fifty and the and the hundred thousand dollar range can definitely have a better shot. But I think the problem is most filmmakers want to see their film. They want to see their name on the marquee. They want to see their film in an actual theater. And so, given the okay. chance. I think nine times out of ten, or ninety-nine times out of a hundred, they're going to go with an actual distributor who can who can make that happen. Right, but in today's world, I mean, not many distribution companies are putting out fifty or hundred thousand dollar movies theatrically. As no, it, they're not. No, I mean, let's 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 bump it up. Let's say it's five hundred thousand. I think million. I think yeah, yeah five hundred thousand or a million. I mean, a lot of people are making you know quality, amazing independent films in that range. That's that's kind of what we're talking about on the low, low, low side. Yeah, there there really isn't a market for the clerks or for the Blair Witch or for the Go Fish or these these historical iconic uh, touchstones of the independent film world that um, were written about in the in the in the John Pearson book. You know, yeah. Spike Mike. That 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 book really covers that that era. Um, you know, those lower lower budgeted films that you know are just like the, the the darlings of of the independent film world of yesteryear. Those are are much harder to release theatrically these days. Now, if you had um, any advice for a filmmaker just starting out in the business, what would it be? Well, you know, I don't um, I don't want to discourage people. But one of the things that the point was <laughs> just go do so, so basically do something else. Just do something I, else. No, it's not do something else. It's just to, to reframe their expectations. I once ran into a very famous filmmaker. I don't want to say who it was, but I ran into a famous filmmaker outside of the Strand Bookstore in New York. I said, "Do you have any advice for aspiring screenwriters?" <laughs> and he said, uh, "It's never too late to quit." <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember thinking to myself, what a jerk. Like, that's what you're going to tell me? And then he, like, patted my shoulder twice and walked away. He didn't even say goodbye. just walked away. And I, I remember thinking, like, I remember, I remember actually telling this story to people, like, this guy is such a jerk. And I was, you know, he could have said something nice. and He could have inspired me. He could have said, don't give up and, you know, just keep going. And I went, you know, I crawled over glass and all the things that he did to get there. But the problem, I think now that I've been through it and I've made an expensive short that had all kinds of problems. And I've written this book, The Real Truth, where I talked to a hundred well-known independent filmmakers. The thing that I realized what he, what I guess he was saying is that if you're getting your electricity shut off and your girlfriend is breaking up with you and all these other things are happening and it's all sort of going wrong, this is not part of the Mardi Gras. Like this is not, I mean, you hear these, these things that happen to people like Kim Pierce talks about getting her phone cut off and having the student loan people calling all the time or mm-hmm. you know, sending letters. The thing is, and people laugh when they hear these these stories of woe, uh, you know, uh, about how they had to eat ramen noodles or Tom Wartenberg uh, had to do- donate blood for for several. Uh, yes, yeah, so Robert Rodriguez did the medical experiments, right? Yeah. Exactly. When you hear these stories, they kind of you get people chuckle and things like that. But the the real issue is if you're if that's happening to you, then you're not doing it right. Then you're not having the right approach. You should not follow your dream to the bottom of the ocean. You shouldn't have to, you know 
it, you, making an independent film, while it's one of the most challenging things you could ever undertake, it should not completely wreck your life and not and and potentially wreck your life, you know, forever. If you're running up huge credit card bills mm -hmm. that take years to pay off, if you're promising pay or play agreements to famous actors, which then the whole project falls through for whatever reason, and you're on the hook for you know a hundred thousand dollar payment for a movie that will never even get made, um, you know, this is not something that someone can write you a note to the PE teacher to get you out of. Like there are a lot of issues where you are making decisions about your life by trying to make an independent film or even just trying to write a screenplay. I mean, writing a screenplay in the middle of the night for an hour a night can have a deleterious uh, and degrading effect on interpersonal relationships. Oh God, yes. You know, and that's something to consider and something people have to be have to be down for. And also there's something people just have to be aware of. So what I tell people who are just starting out is, a, the financing is going to take twice as long as you think. B, you need a, a financing effort to finance the financing effort because you can't sustain it on your own. You actually need some seed capital just to get things going and get things rolling. You need to um, you know, realize that there's not one person who's going to make things happen. There's not one person who's got a camera, one cinematographer who owns their own equipment, or one wealthy individual that you're friends with, or one family member who's going to make everything happen. You have to forget about that. There are all sorts of avenues. You, you may not have to spend any money. You can get accepted to a festival and get attract producers um, you know, with a script. You can attract producers and, and get your film financed that way. The thing that, that the most important piece of this for the people who are starting out is to A, read a book. It doesn't have to be my book, but read a book that will tell you about the pitfalls you're about to encounter. And B, know that if a lot of things are going wrong and your whole life is falling apart, you might be uh, Steve Buscemi and living in oblivion mm -hmm. and it might be funny like oh i remember this happened to to nicholas rev nick rev in the movie yes and i or i remember that this happened to darren aronofsky when he was talking about on a panel discussion about all the challenges he had with making pie but again if it's happening to you you may you may want to regroup or back up or just halt the whole thing and restart once you have things better organized because you may not be approaching it in the right way I, I once worked with a filmmaker years 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 ago uh and he financed his movie which was a two hundred thousand dollar movie, um, by asking his his um, his uh, his uh, in laws for the money, and uh, the movie uh, was 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 did not do well. Let's just put it that way. And I'm like, my God, what kind of pressure on that relationship is that? I mean, like, you know, it's one thing to take two hundred thousand of your own money, but imagine taking two hundred grand. <laughs> Of your in-laws' money and just flushing it down the toilet. I'm assuming Thanksgiving dinner is not going to be the same. I mean, that's. I mean, it's it's probably even worse than that because what happens typically on low-budget independent films is that you know people need finishing funds or they run out of money or they budgeted mm -hmm. incorrectly or something like mm -hmm. that or they want to add a certain sequence or they want to have a crane day. So this friend of yours may not only it may not only have been the first two hundred thousand. They oh, may no. have gone back. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? Imagine if they have to go to the in-laws and say, "Listen, I know I just spent the two hundred thousand dollars, but I budgeted it wrong. So now to be able to get get your two hundred, you know, to be able to return the the the, the initial two hundred, I need another two hundred, or maybe I mean, you know, I need another four hundred or whatever it was that they budgeted incorrectly for. So, oh, um, so it it can and and again, you don't want to put you don't want to put because. At the end of the day, you know, your, your film is the most important thing to some people, yes, but you don't want to put all of your independent, your interpersonal relationships at risk just mm -hmm. to realize this vision um, for a film that may, that people may or may not ever watch. And you don't want to essentially be alone, sitting alone at home with a Blu-ray of your movie, uh, you know, watching it um, by the flickering light of your <laughs> Of your, <laughs> of your standard def de definition. Your standard def yes. While exactly. while exactly. Sta what yeah. <laughs> standard def TV yeah. that's on yeah. cinder blocks. <laughs> you have, yeah, or you have like a TV that has like rabbit ears, or it has like a you know it has the, the old timey uh, antenna. Yes, so. eating eating ramen noodles with ketchup in the fridge. Right. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's, you just you don't want to end up like that. And people, ne the problem is at festivals and all these other things. People never hear those stories. And I was somebody who went to Cannes. I went to Sundance three times. You hear all these stories on the panels. You hear all these stories, which are inspirational. I went to, you know, the American film market in L.A. and I attended IFFM and then, you know, it became the IFP. And I was, you know, hobnobbing and meeting all these people. And I was so inspired by all the work. And, you know, you always hear these great stories of people who persevered and who never, you know, never quit. And they kept going, going, going. 
But what you don't hear are these just harrowing stories of people who, you know, ended up with thirty thousand dollars in credit card debt, or you know, who who unfortunately mortgaged or leveraged all of their friends and family, and ended up, you know, ended up in kind of a pickle. And and this is not people you've never heard of. This is people who have made it. And mm-hmm. whose first films are not their first films. The first films that you know about are actually their second or their third films. So that's what I tried to capture in The Real Truth so people can have a reality check and not approach things in a way that's going to be self-immolating. You, you know, a lot of people have hobbies. They might um, be gardeners or they might, you know, build model ships or whatever it is. But a lot of people don't have hobbies or dreams or goals that that have such a potentially devastating impact on their, on their personal lives. And that's something that people really need to, you know, I I know you don't want to be a wet blanket or a Debbie Downer, but it's something that people really need to take more stock of. Oh, I talk about that constantly. I'm, I'm, I always tell everybody as real as I can get it because I, I was, I was similar to you. You wrote your book. I started up in the film hustle specifically to that, to give people real information about what it's really like out here uh, doing this. And it's, it's not easy. Uh, and it's a long game. It's definitely not a short game by any stretch. And a lot of people fall into that whole lottery ticket mentality of like, I'm going to make a movie, get into Sundance, and Harvey Weinstein is going to write me a check for five million bucks, and the rest is history. Uh, and then I could just go off and go to the Oscars. Like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it, it, you know, there's a, that's a great point that you made, Alex, because the thing is, a lot of people, and I actually thought this, I thought I was kind of, I was fairly sophisticated, but I thought if you can just make a low budget film, then you can end up with a three picture deal, this, this, <laughs> fa- this, fa- this fairy tale three picture deal where yep. you're set for life and you get to write, you know, you get a, you get a bungalow on the lot. And you, right. You, <laughs> Next you, to, you have lunch with Spielberg. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> but you, or, or you know, not even that, or they just, you know, you know, somebody's going to cover your rent and you'll be able to you'll have the three projects that you can do you're going to follow this sort of kevin smith model where people are going to hand you rewrite jobs oh yeah that's another one like if you can just write a script just write that first script you can just get that one film finished then you'll get all these screenwriting rewrite jobs for a hundred thousand dollars a pop i mean that just does not it's just not a thing anymore that's even Why worse than being a filmmaker like sc- screenwriters is actually tougher than being a filmmaker because sc- anyone can write a screenplay it's very low cost of entry to make a film is a very high cost of entry. But one thing that people also don't consider is that a lot of their famous I'm, I'm sorry, a lot of the a lot of the well-known filmmakers that they admire that they want to emulate, they're all doing TV these days. They're not yep. it's That's very where the money is. <laughs> well, it's not just because the money is there, like the big money. They're doing it to make a living. I mean, people yeah. It's very tough to make a living at that. A lot of times people who are producing independent films, the director may get, you know, the director may become Colin Trevorrow or something like that. But the producer and everybody else who's worked on this project and and helped make it a reality are not necessarily along for that ride. And so that's one thing that's very hard to take. The other thing is just that that there's not um, that the TV is really where a lot of people are, are, are ha- have to make their sort of daily rent money from from something like that. And so it's not necessarily the economics of independent film are such these days that it's very tough to imagine that you're just going to be an independent, a troubadour independent filmmaker who makes these low budget films and somehow uh, earns enough back to to make a living from that. It is extremely difficult. That's why I mean, and that's why I've been in post for the last 20 years. That ba- post has basically been able, been able to, for me to to, and I also direct commercials and music videos, but those are those things that that help supplement my habit. A lot of the creativity, a mm-hmm. lot of the risk taking in terms of story ideas and story arcs. I mean, you know, ever since Breaking Bad and The mm-hmm. Sopranos, you know, TV is really where a lot of the creativity is is happening. So there's there's also sort of a creative reason why people would want to migrate from from independent film to, to episodic TV. But but again, mostly it's just because. If you if you write and direct an, an independent film once every three years and take it to Sundance and then sell it, <laughs> or maybe even if even if you were able to sell it at Sundance, which only about a dozen films out of the 120 that are that are. If there, you're lucky, if you're lucky, yeah. You're lucky, yeah. If you do that once every three years, that's not that's not enough to sustain your you know Life. your meager <laughs> lifestyle. It just isn't. It just isn't. So there's other you know people are teaching. They're, they're like you, they're doing, you know, they're doing other things. They might be uh, editors, they might be working mm-hmm. in post, or there's some other aspect of the, of the creative industry, but it's not necessarily just from straight up independent filmmaking. Now, um, what I always ask the same last two questions of all my guests. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Huh, gosh. <laughs> well, you know, again, um, my whole goal with writing the independent film book 
guide, textbook, whatever you want to call it, the real truth. Everything you didn't know, everything you didn't need, know you need to know about making an independent film is really designed to get out ahead of all of these roadblocks and pitfalls that people are going to run into. I mean, originally, the, the original title was actually ro- uh, Landmines on the Road to Sundance. Because it's a so great title. Actually, that's a really yeah, great title. I know, that's a really great title. <laughs> I had a great cover too, but the real truth was kind of a little more uh, low key. But, um, you know, the thing that, that it takes you the longest to learn about, about this space, I think, is just that there, it's um, – one of the things that's also a challenge is that there isn't really like you finish your screenplay and you type the, you know, fade out. And that's just a, such an amazing momentous moment because you did it. You've written a first draft or a second draft. And the thing is confetti doesn't fall from the ceiling. <laughs> that's the thing. Right, right. It's very hard to take the fact that, you know, you might get into a festival and that's amazing. That's a huge accomplishment. And there are other festivals in Sundance. Yes, there are a ton of festivals, but the thing is, it's like, you know, again, it, your life does not change on that day. The same way if you sell your film at a festival, your life, you're not suddenly like swimming in money because the money that the, 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 the money that's promised for the sale of the film may be actually commitments for marketing and distribution. It's not a big publisher's clearinghouse check. And so your life doesn't change then either because also you have to have all the deliverable. There's a deliverable uh, issue where you have to make sure that all of the sound and all the signed contracts and everything else, chain of title, has to be delivered to the distributor. All the music has to be cleared by you, not by them. All these things that have to happen before you'll get the disbursement from the check. So it's just incredibly long lead. And so the timelines that people set for themselves and say, well, if I, if I can finish this film by September – you know, then I'll, I'll everything will be great. I'm, I have enough budget. I have enough to live on until June or however they do it. They have their timelines are just way off. The, the timelines have to telescope dramatically because it might take you more than a year. It might take you two years. It might take you three years, actually. And so people have to expand that. And also just that at each step of the way where you expect the confetti to fall from the ceiling, it just it, nobody cares. That's the hard part. It, yeah. it, yes. You might have a charmed life, and I'm not. I'm not trying to be discouraging or anything like that. I'm just trying to give people a reality check, or just you know, get them to get their expectations settled. That you know, it's a very long road, and that you have to be the cheerleader for your own project, and you have to have a reservoir, like a, definitely a, a Werner Herzog level of commitment and um, you know, stamina to get to the end of the finish line because it's just much longer than people realize. And and the thing I think. That, that I've learned the hard way and that I, again, I actually talk about relationships and the real truth is that you just don't want to be losing girlfriends over this thing. You don't want to have, <laughs> you don't, you, do, you don't want to have like, you know, the people who are closest to you, um, you know, have them sort of become casualties of this monomaniacal Ahab like project to get your first or second film made. You have to have balance. You have to know when to put your, your laptop down you have to know when to give it a break, give it a rest. You can't be up until three in the morning every night writing your screenplay. I mean, that's just the fastest way to being single your whole life. Basically. <laughs> I mean, some people say, you know, th- I'm keeping it real. You know, this is what it takes. This is what it requires. This is the kind of commitment it requires. And if you can't, you know, be on board with that, then you must not have faith in me. That's that's not that's not actually the case. People can have people in your life can have faith in you and they can believe in you, but you can't over you can't over leverage that and, and count that they'll count on that. They'll just roll with it forever because it's, it's very hard to, to find people who, um, who share your vision, whether they're part of your crew or part of your family. And so you have to take that into account. You can't just assume that everybody's along for the ride. And, uh, as Mark Duplass says, the Calvary is not coming. It's, well, tell, tell me about what he said. What, what he basically had this amazing, uh, keynote on the South by Southwest at South by Southwest, like a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, I, I'll put a link on it in the show notes for everyone to to, re- to listen to. I did a whole article on it because it was as real of uh, of the truth as you can get. And he just basically said, "This is what's going to happen, and this is how it's going to be. And if you think the Calvary's coming, they're not. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be saved at the last minute. No one's going to show up with a magic check or a magic distribution deal. It's not happening." And then he basically says, this is how you do. You make your first movie for a thousand bucks. Go out, make a movie for a thousand bucks. Get a bunch of your friends, get a camera. Doesn't have to be anything special. Go out and shoot a movie. Put it together. You can get get it edited fairly cheaply on your own laptop. Put it together. See how it works. Then, now you have a movie. Then you go in and you do another. And then when you're done with that movie, do another movie. Maybe make another movie for a thousand bucks or maybe even two thousand bucks. And then do that. 
Then after you have two films, then you go after um, a TV star and you talk to them and you're like, hey, I'm going to – and then he just goes into this whole map of how to do it. And it's doable, but it's not a short game and it's not that lottery ticket mentality or the confetti falling from the ceiling. It's hard work that's going to take years to make happen. It's not something that's going to happen uh, that first time out the gate. Very rarely does that happen. The Robert Rodriguez's of the world – are, are I mean, I can count on one hand how many of those stories have happened in the last 20 years. But that's everything – that's all, anything – everybody always hears these stories. And that's why I always try to debunk this myth that like you always hear about the lottery winner. You don't hear about the millions of lottery losers. But to your not- point, Alex, it's not even that. I mean the part of the fun of playing the lottery is just playing the lottery itself. So that that's that yeah. itself is, is, is something. But the thing is everyone points to Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez as the shorthand. Well, those guys, they made their films in like – when was that? 1993 or something? 91, like that, you know, 92. 91 and 92. 92. OK. Yeah. So 91, 92 or what, Reservoir Dogs. You know, I mean that – people are still pointing to something that's like a million years ago when there was a completely different – you know, an independent World. film was in the middle of its heyday, and 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 you know, it was just you know, it was just an exciting, incredible time. And it was also just you know, the, the like you said with the wine scenes, uh, you know, Harvey's going to step in. You know, that was people who were at the top of their game. I mean, almost every independent film, it was almost like a bubble. It was like a, hu- a housing bubble mm-hmm. because every independent film that came out was like you know, this incredible game changing you know, hit, you had this, you had this interval where you had these this string of hit hits. after hit and after hit. Yeah. After hit, hit after hit, like hit. every single thing. And even again, even paranormal so, activity, like paranormal activity right. is another one like that. That's a, but right. again, that's sure. two in 20 years. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Uh, well, I'm kind of old school sci-fi. So I think Blade Runner, Aliens, yep. and, uh, kind of, a uh, the third one on that list, which I think is an important film that people should see is the original, um, the original On the Beach with Gregory Peck. I don't know if you've seen that. It's I have not. Old time. No. Old timey science fiction. Not the new remake version with Armand Asante. You can leave that one alone. But mm-hmm. the original uh, 1950, I think it's 1956, On the Beach uh, with Gregory Peck. He plays a submarine commander. It's it's actually I think it's a, it's an it's a it's an un, un, undervalued, undiscovered gem that I think I would recommend for people if they can find it on Netflix or. Or um, even just even just buy it used on Amazon or, or however they come by it. Very cool, man. So, so where can people find you? Or buy it new on Amazon. You know, give the give the original author some some money. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. What am I talking about buying used on Amazon? Buy things new on Amazon. Don't do the rebuying. <laughs> that, that's the thing. Like, when, when authors who have worked and poured their blood, sweat, and tears into things. Authors don't get paid when you buy a used copy. So very true. If you can, buy, if you can afford to spend another couple of bucks. To buy a, a new copy, it helps. Uh, it, every little bit helps. It helps uh, the authors so they can write the next book. They're not trying to get wealthy. They're not trying to get rich. They just want to be able to write the next one. Amen. Um, Amen. So where can people find you? Um, well, I'm at The Real Truth on Twitter, and um, I think that's probably the best way to hit me up. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely open to answering questions. If anybody has any questions, they can just uh, they can find me there, and I can uh, you know offer whatever guidance I have, and also they could you know they can post um, they can actually post questions. I think I think actually Amazon has a comments section for the real truth, and you can post questions there, and we can have sort of an interaction in the authors the authors section of that page. So that be happy to answer any questions that people might have, or advice, or guidance, or anything anything at all about that. And I'll put links to uh, to to your book and and everything else on the show notes as well. So, um, Realman, thank you so much um, for being on the show. I really really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. I'm really delighted to do it, and it's great to discuss discuss these things again. I want to help people. Um, you know, definitely keep their feet on the ground whether they're trying to make their first or second film. Thanks, Reed. Appreciate it. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed uh, my conversation with Reed Martin. He has a lot of great insights. Uh, and after, I mean, obviously, you interview a hundred very successful indie filmmakers, uh, which is an oxymoron in general. No, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. We're here to be successful, people. We're here to be successful as independent filmmakers, and that's why we're doing all of this. God damn it. Anyway, uh, after interviewing so many filmmakers, I mean, uh, the book has a lot of great information in it about what to avoid 
uh, in it. So definitely check it out. I'll leave that all in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 144. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 144. And don't forget to head over to FreeFilmBook.com. That's FreeFilmBook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobook from Audible. So that's it for this week, guys. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you picked up some uh, some knowledge bombs, a little couple nuggets of information that helps you along your path as an independent filmmaker. And just a quick update, I do have some very interesting stuff I'm working on coming up in the next few months. So definitely keep an eye out for some cool stuff coming from Indie Film Hustle uh, and some other little surprises I have for you guys. So as always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.